It's my pleasure to have Dr. Harold Atkins participating on our webinar today and to give our first webinar. Dr. Atkins is a physician at the Ottawa Hospital uh, Blood and Marrow Transplant Program, and he's Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. He's also a scientist at the Center for Innovative Cancer Research, and he's the Medical Director of the Regenerative Medicine Program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. His work specializes in the management of patients requiring stem cell transplantation, and he spearheaded the use of stem cell transplantation for immune repair to treat patients with uh, severe autoimmune diseases, uh, in particular MS, uh, which we're going to hear about today. Dr. Atkins is um, a renowned leader in the field, and it's uh, our pleasure to have him participate in today's webinar. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Atkins to give the presentation. Thank you. Uh, David, and um, thank you for the invitation. Um, what I hope to cover today um, is is really, um, in the end, it's a list of many of the challenges that I faced, or if you wanted to be less kind, perhaps some of the mistakes that have been made along the way. And um, what we've learned from them, and, and I hope to pass on these the lessons that I've I've learned so that um, this whole endeavor of moving basic research discoveries into the clinic happens in a more efficient and and smoother manner. And and really, what I've 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 done is I've I've broken this up into a series of little um, ideas that uh, I, I wanted to pass on. And so I'm going to just uh, start by saying I have no disclosures, uh, financial or other conflicts, and then give you a, a, a list here of some of the research that I've been involved with over the last 20 years. And so this involves uh, one of the first trials that I, I worked on, uh, which was um, using HLA half-identical donors for allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplants. And this uh, was spurred by the idea that perhaps we can overcome HLA barriers to bone marrow transplantation. And because that seemed to work, I wondered if, if the same lessons could be applied to uh, autoimmune diseases where you could develop tolerance to a, a, a problem that was already uh, that was present. And so, I launched a number of trials in rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis and organ transplantation. And then as um, uh, colleagues were around in the field of stem cell transplantation developed, uh, I was involved with some trials of mobilizing stem cells after myocardial infarction to see if we could repair uh, the heart and a similar one in stroke. And more recently, with the advent of of gene engineering and a CAR T cell uh, trial, we uh, I, I've been involved with the group to try to uh, develop a program in CAR T cells, and and so there's a whole of these these uh, seven trials have given me uh, some thoughts about uh, uh, because they've not all been smooth and they've not all been successful, and. Um, and, and, and so, well, you'll see how, how um, you know, this is a very complicated field to, uh, uh, to navigate. So one of the, the first lessons that I, I learned was um, clinical trials have a timeliness, and you need to know what else is going on in, in the field. And so I was um, involved in... Um, developing a trial in 1997 for trying uh, autologous stem cell transplants for rheumatoid arthritis. That was uh, a very uh, novel concept in the trans time. Transplanters are, are hematologists, they aren't rheumatologists, and so there was only a, um, a rudimentary understanding that the drug companies were working were working on uh, other other um, uh, drugs, and so 
a year after we started to develop our our trial, um, drug companies uh, had two drugs approved by the FDA for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, infliximab and etanercept. And that didn't seem to influence us because we were in Canada, so we had a few patients referred. You can see we had one patient referred to us for our trial in 1999 and a second patient referred to us in 2000. But by 2001, Health Canada approved the use of etanercept and infleximab in uh, Canada. And then um, enrollment in our trial slowed down. The third patient didn't appear till uh, three years later. And after that, we never saw any more patients until our trial using this novel therapy which seemed successful in the three patients was uh, superseded by um, um, uh, treatment with with uh, uh, competing drugs. The, um, the second lesson is the. Sorry, there's someone uh, on the line. Is that? Um... Yeah, I'm going to put it on presenter mode. Hold on a sec. Thank the you. conference is in lecture mode. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, go for it. Good. So, so the second lesson is that um, the success of a trial really depends on successful partnerships, and so we had um, a partnership for the first trial. But when something they thought was better came along, the partnership didn't really hold up and the trial floundered. All parties need to be committed to the project to be able to bring a, a clinical trial to fruition and to do it in a timely manner. And so, for instance, our CAR T-cell trial, uh, we started this about two years ago with a group of scientists and clinicians who each had a piece of the infrastructure or a piece of the, the puzzle that needed to be put together to uh, actually uh, make a CAR T cell trial feasible. So, you know, we needed someone who could do DNA recombinant engineering, someone who could make plasmids, someone who could make, uh, transform this into a virus, GMP manufacturing of a virus, GMP manufacturing of the gene engineered cells and clinicians who were able to um, collect cells, lymphocytes from patients to be engineered and who could treat the patients after they were, were uh, the, the cells were made. And so by putting together a, a group of, of patients across Canada that each had a piece of the puzzle and who all were dedicated to the idea of developing a CAR T cell program we were able to go from conception to having a clinical trial application approved by Health Canada in two years. And we'll probably, uh, we're about a month and a half away from being able to treat our first patient. And so, uh, again, the whole group is committed to it and has committed resources and committed their time and effort to make this project successful. Similarly, um, I've worked uh, on the, this trial, Capital STEM MI, was, the idea was to take patients with big heart attacks that had um, damage to their heart, and we would give them uh, filgrastim to mobilize their hematopoietic stem cells into the circulation to see if there was a reparative effect from that. It was a partnership between a stem cell physicians and a cardiologist here in Ottawa, and uh, there was a commitment to it, but there were other trials uh, going on at the same time. And so it took 53 months to enroll 86 patients with myocardial infarction, a common disease. And so you can see how, again, uh, diverting attention from a trial can influence uh, how successful the trial will be or how quickly the trial will, will uh, accrue patients. And a third example is using a similar sort of strategy to mobilize patients with stroke, again, a common disease. 
this was a trial that needed about uh, less than 20 patients. And because the partnership was um, not as solid, it was never completed. So, so again, I can't emphasize uh, the importance of the successful partnerships. There's also a value in patients, which is, is kind of hard when you're writing grants on three or four year or five year cycles. Um, but sometimes you need the long follow up to have very solid results. And um, I give as an example, our trial uh, using hematopoietic stem cell transplants to treat patients with multiple sclerosis. Again, the hypothesis is to uh, replace their immune system, which is the, the diseased organ in multiple sclerosis, not the damaged organ, that's the, the nervous system, and to see if you can halt further damage. And the con conception of that trial started in 1997. We submitted a grant in 1998. We got comments back a year later. It was finally approved in 2000. It needed revisions because it's the, the ideas behind it were three years old. And REB approval and enrollment started in, in 2001. It took eight years to enroll. And from about the time we were halfway through that period, people asked me to keep start writing it up. But the results were not important until about the summer of 2015 when we had significant follow-up on these patients that was completely um, showed that, that patients who had undergone this transplant had a transformation in the natural history of their disease. And so this turned out to be a very powerful observation. And when we submitted it for publication, rather than a uh, highly specialized bone marrow transplant or multiple sclerosis journal, this was able to be published in The Lancet. And the, the delay in publication and the accumulation of, of better observations and stronger observations give you uh, some power to have a more impactful publication. Harry, there was one quick question. Uh, John is asking, was there a consideration for a pilot RCT prior to embarking on a definitive trial to scope out recruitment rate as a potential outcome? Um, so a couple of these trials were pilot trials. Again, the multiple sclerosis trial was uh, an N of 24. The rheumatoid arthritis trial was an N of, of um, you know, less than 20. And so none of these trials are, are uh, big trials where you might do a few patients. Uh, these were uh, thorough, these were trials that were focused on looking for big effect sizes in small populations that are very well studied. And so um, a pilot RCTs are, uh, pilot trials haven't been a, a useful uh, part of, of this field, at least for, for these kind of trials. Uh, as we plan our uh, a next generation RCT, we are in a better position, uh, in the MS field at least, to uh, use our, our first trials observation um, to, to um, uh, design that trial. And so, so uh, it, again, the pilots are, are important, but sometimes the pilots can be very useful for information other than looking at accrual or endpoints or, or what sounds reasonable. Um, the fourth um, observation that I have, or the first fourth lesson, is really the power of multiple endpoints. And so um, a lot of clinical trials that I read or a lot of drug trials have a single endpoint, uh, you know, who's better at the end of a certain period of time of treatment. But diseases are multidimensional, the biology is complex, the treatments are complex, and I think there's a power or a, a, to, to having outcome measures that reflect that. And so in our uh, trial of transplant for MS patients, 
we used a, a number of endpoints, and so we would study relapse, uh, which is the hallmark of the acute inflammatory events early on in the, 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 the disease. We would look at clinical events like relapses and radiologic changes like new MRI lesions. And the two are, are two measurements of the same aspect of the biology. But we would also look at progression, uh, the progression of disabilities or the accumulation of disabilities using a validated clinical scale, using serial MRI uh, volumetric analysis of, of the brain, and biochemical changes in the CSF or the um, serum looking for hallmarks of, of brain damage. And we would marry that with what we were actually doing to the immune system, both at a, a fairly um, high level, like changes in lymphocyte subpopulation and what happens during lymphopoiesis, but also at a very granular level looking at antigen-specific reactivity, cellular function response to, to uh, immunization after the transplant to understand how the immune system was working and how that was affecting the, the nature of the disease. And when all of those align to give us the same message, it's, I think, a lot more powerful. It allows you to do trials with fewer patients than if you just do the simple end of, you know, um, let's count who's, who's alive and who's dead at the end of a certain period of time or who's disabled and who's not disabled at this uh, uh, end of time. The, the fifth lesson is that common knowledge isn't, sometimes isn't. And so uh, we were told a lot of things about um, measuring drug levels in our patients. And so we use a drug called Fusulfan. It's uh, absorbed from the bowel, metabolized through the liver, and then uh, its effects are in the serum. And so its, it's uh, pharmacokinetics and dynamics are quite erratic when it's, it's given orally. And what we found in our first three patients was their levels were very high. We had to drop the dose of the drug to give them uh, an area under the curve that was reasonable, and it was unpredictable. And, and then after the first three patients, we found out, oh, that the lab that we had thought was doing this because they did it for um, many patients in their clinical program, actually their standards were wrong. And uh, the patients received a dose that was probably about three times what we expected. And so those first three patients in our trial um, had dose reductions that were equivalent to reducing the dose of the drug we wanted to give by about uh, a third. We then um, switched to an intravenous form. We had uh, the levels of become standardized and more appropriate. The measurements were appropriate. And then we were told, oh, by switching to the, from the oral to the intravenous, your, um, the intravenous drug is more bioactive, and, and so you have to reduce the dose again. And comparing the oral dose and the intravenous dose, we didn't see much of a difference in, in the pharmacokinetics. And, and so, again, another lesson of what people had told us were common knowledge that uh, first pass in the liver got rid of a lot of your drugs didn't turn out true. And so it's important to validate all aspects of your trial that you can think of uh, before you start so that you're sure that everything's going to work properly. The second, uh, or the sixth lesson I learned is uh, enrollment is always an unpredictable thing. And the only Thing that you can expect is that it's going to be unpredictable. And so our MS trial uh, enrollment, we never expected that there would be a lot of patients enrolled, but you can see at the beginning we started, there were about three patients per year. We had a first SAE, so there was a bit of a hold in our patient, uh, so, so that's why in the third year there were less patients. In that picked up after uh, a period of time. And then we had a second SAE 
and then we didn't see enrollment for a year before patients got referred to us. And so um, as the study came back online, it took a little bit of convincing to have more patients enrolled. And ultimately, as the trial became successful, our, our recruitment keeps going up now and, and uh, based on this, the early findings. And so there's always a slow part at the beginning, but as uh, people become more comfortable with your treatment options in, in a randomized trial or in a single arm trial, uh, towards the end of the trial, you should pick up in terms of your enrollment. The other, um, the next lesson regards research ethics board applications. And um, there are two parts to this. One is the manual for how we conduct trials is actually very, very well written. And anybody doing um, clinical trial on, a, on patients should read it because it really does provide you a good basis of, of, of what you should be considering. And it um, also tells you really what you do need to consider as you write your trial so that it, it really is ethic, ethical and that you have the safeguards to protect patients. And that's good for you, it's good for the patient, good for your institution. They keep changing and so you have to keep up with them and, and be aware of the latest uh, policies in, in this field. The other thing is that institutions have different policies and the research ethics board, when you apply to it, isn't usually just concerned with ethics. And for instance, in Ottawa, our REB application also goes to the contracts and to the legal people at the same time. And you're not really sure why that happens and, and so you have to provide additional information or um, sometimes it takes quite a bit longer than just the ethics review. And so you have to be uh, cognizant of that. And, and uh, if your trial is, you're trying to get it accomplished in a period of time, you have to put some pressure to, to move the, the non-ethics review along in a, a, a pragmatic fashion. Just to, to come to lesson eight, the changing regulations. And again, um, uh, what I can tell you is when I started in clinical trials, I didn't have to register my trial. The uh, original MS trial started before Health Canada had the mandate to review all, or all trials. And, uh, and so there were things that you didn't have to be quite as rigorous with. That has changed and, um, uh, you know, since then uh, there's been a lot better oversight and that's led to better trials so that, you know, you get better documentation, you've thought about your experiment better and you're more likely to um, be successful with, with completing the trial. And, and so again, the, the guidance documents are, are important. There are new guidance documents that go beyond Health Canada. And so we found out as we were doing our, our gene therapy trial or, or developing it, that there are now um, Environment Canada has this new substances notification regulations. And while these regulations were initially designed to take care of uh, you know, environmental contamination and to prevent new substances from getting out in the the, the world, uh, chemicals out in the world, they've been applied now to animal products and, and viral products and now recombinant DNA. And so uh, a gene modified uh, cell is a, a, is a new substance and you have to uh, apply to this. And, and there's a whole set of paperwork that you have to do and you have to understand the questions they want, otherwise you'll, your, your research trial will get bog down. Lesson number nine is that everything's changing, not just the regulations. And so journal requirements have gotten quite a bit more rigorous um, over time. You know, they've had new um, rules about uh, conflict of interest uh, uh, disclosures, uh, 
the authorship, you actually have to justify what each of the authors have been involved with. They want to see data. Uh, they like primary data. They need a better statistical analysis. They want to know about sponsorship, and it goes on and on. And, and again, while that uh, seems like more effort on your part, it actually leads to better information being disseminated. Where you can loop around, though, is is once you understand what the journals want, um, you can um, design your trials so that your trial is is easy to get published. And so, for instance, in our our CAR T cell protocol. Um, people initially had this idea, oh, well, let's write this, you know, one of our endpoints, our secondary endpoints, going to be feasibility. And they just wanted to put, we will determine the feasibility. But that's kind of a washout. What are you going to measure when you're looking at feasibility? And the journal's going to want to know what your endpoint is. And so having very uh, clear metrics that you're going to measure in your endpoint, like the proportion of participants who fail enrollment that were successfully screened and the reason for their failure, is easy for the journal to understand. It's easy for you to know what to measure, and it will help you uh, clarify when you go to publish what you were actually looking for. And so at all stages, having these very precise endpoints rather than, oh, I'm going to study feasibility, safety, and efficacy. But actually what you're going to measure is, and how, what you're going to analyze is uh, uh, something that I, I've taken to doing in my trials, and I would highly recommend it. Lesson number 10 is that uh, it was a surprise to me, and I've only learned it recently. So I thought doing the trial was really hard. But it turns out actually disseminating the information that you learned and, and getting people to be cognizant of it is even harder than doing the trial. And so there's a huge number of, of transplants done for multiple sclerosis. And here is data on the number of transplants done and reported to the European Bone Marrow Transplant Registry per year um, from uh, over the last 20 years. And it goes from the first one in 1995 to um, the last year that was in this publication was 2015, 100, almost 125 transplants. And so all told, there are several hundred patients that have had transplants for multiple sclerosis. If you do, a um, again, an ad hoc analysis and you put down the response rate, so we use an endpoint called no evidence of disease activity. This means that the patient's alive, has not had a clinical relapse, has not had a new MRI lesion show up, and has not progressed. Uh, the, a number of trials uh, are shown on this graph and show that there's a very high percentage of patients that have no evidence of disease activity following an autologous transplant for multiple sclerosis for a very long time. This is the trial that I've been involved with. This is the trial that uh, has been involved from uh, the United States called the HALT-MS trial. This is a trial from Sweden uh, where they published it. And you can see that there's a nice plateau on these, at least two of these trials, to suggest that patients aren't continuing to have disease activity. What's shown at the bottom here are the same statistics, no evidence of disease activity, for um, drug trials, the randomized drug trials done by drug companies. The blue blue dots are the um, the trials that um, that's the the new drug in the trials, and the orange dots are the um, um, the placebo arm. And so you can see placebo. Well, most patients have some evidence of disease activity after one or two years. In the drug trials, the very best activity has been about 50% of the patients remain free of disease. 
And if you look at longitudinal cohorts of patients that receive these drugs, their, their disease activity continues and the number of patients that have no evidence of disease activity uh, drops over time compared to the transplant arm. And so this, you know, it's not a randomized trial, but it's some evidence that stem cell transplantation is a, has a very important therapeutic modality, and yet there are 101 arguments by the uh, community about why transplantation shouldn't be used in this time, that it's too experimental, that there are not enough patients, um, or, or it hasn't been done in a randomized fashion, the, these trials. And, and so, uh, like good scientists, I think you have to explore and use the knowledge that you have at the time when you address your patients and, um, and then strive to keep making the information better. But the part that you have to, to use is really get the information out to the community in a way that convinces them the importance of that, of that information. The, the last lessons I want to talk about in the, the last five or seven minutes are about trial design. And so um, everybody talks in, uh, well, again, not maybe not everybody, but a lot of the students I work with who are, are uh, residents or a lot of clinicians who I talk to, their idea of, a, of, of a, the gold standard is always a randomized trial. And short of a randomized trial, the information is suboptimal. And I think you need to keep an open mind about trial design. So first of all, you may not have a big enough population to do a randomized trial. Second, you might not have a, 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 the natural history of the disease might be different. There might be uh, arguments against uh, randomizing ethical arguments. And so you have to take into consideration how big the effect size is. Are there other treatments available for their patients? And is there a strong and agreed on natural history? And you may be able to um, develop very powerful results in the context of uh, certain diseases where you don't need a randomized trial. And I can think of, of examples in cell therapy uh, more recently where um, I've read a very powerful trial about uh, gene-modified autologous stem cell transplant for some congenital lipid storage diseases, and they treated seven or eight patients and, you know, these children would normally end up uh, uh, severely disabled and or, or dying from their disease in infancy or childhood and they have uh, children who have had these transplants who are biochemically normal corrected and are, are thriving. And so in that situation, First, there's no other disease treatment. Second, it's a huge effect size, and there's a strong natural history, and they didn't need to do a randomized control trial, and that would be unethical anyway. It was similar with our MS trial, uh, where we saw a big effect size. And so at the time we started, there were very few other treatments. Many of our patients ended up having failed those treatments. And if you look at our primary result, which is um, relapsing, uh, relapses, um, shown here in this cartoon, we have patients, they're, they're, the time of diagnosis, the line starts, and the line goes for as long as we follow them, and they're lined up at time zero here as the time that they had their transplant, and each individual upside down trial, uh, our triangle is a relapse, and you can see in this, this um, a diagram of our results, many of these patients had very many relapses before the transplant and none afterwards. And so big effect size, the uh, st statistician who I took it to said, you don't need statistics to tell you that this is an important finding. And, you know, to, to make the point again to the journal and to the readers, rather than just rely on objective data, 
we looked at MRI lesions, new MRI lesions, uh, a, a similar a measurement of the similar biologic process. And again, when their patients are enrolled in the trial, the line starts, the line goes until their last follow-up. Each uh, line tick mark below is a, an MRI scan, and each MRI with a new lesion or some evidence of disease activity has an inverted triangle. And you can see that all the activity is beforehand. And so these two measures correlate with each other. And again, with a strong effect size and a, a change in a well-known and well-recognized natural history of disease, this becomes a very powerful result. Sorry. Oops. So, um, the next thing that you should consider in your trial design is really know what you want to learn. And part of this uh, is I wanted to talk about inclusion criteria because everybody wants to specify things uh, very, very well in your inclusion criteria. It's like, you know, like when you do uh, your experiments, you want to choose the right cells, you want to choose the right chemicals. Our clinical trials are like this, but it's a little bit more fuzzy, and you get trouble by over-specifying and under-specifying. And so these are examples from the trials that I did, the MS trial, the patients uh, who were eligible were between 18 and 51 years old. So, of course, one of the patients that comes to you is 51. And so by rights, they're outside the criteria of this trial, but, you know, is 51 much different than 50? Is that going to be important in your trial? It's hard to, to say. And so you have to have some understanding of, of how selective you need to be in, in choosing your patients. Maybe we want 51-year-olds if they have new, highly active, relapsing multiple sclerosis, but not if they're 50 and they don't have they only have multiple sclerosis that has the, only the occasional relapse. And so you might have to take that into account in your, your inclusion criteria. I was working with a group in Toronto. We were interested in, to see if patients with solid organ transplants uh, could undergo hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and uh, whether that would allow them to develop tolerance to their transplanted solid organ, in this case, liver transplants. And when we talked about it, um, we had some very idea, uh, very broad ideas of our inclusion criteria. And so we wrote very open criteria. Basically, they could have any disease that was, and their liver transplant was going bad, or they could have a complication of immune suppression and they could be eligible. But in the end, when we were looking for our patients, because of the risks, we selected patients with autoimmune damage to their liver that wasn't going away after the liver transplant. And, and so as we've progressed through this trial and we're in the process of modifying it for, uh, with some amendments, we really have gotten rid of some of the other indications because we don't think they're severe enough for the risk that the patient faces. Um, I think I'm going to skip a few of these and um, just maybe finish up with one more idea. And this comes back to uh, composite endpoints that I talked about earlier. It, they're important. They're uh, kind of um, a mixed bag, right? And so by having a composite endpoint, they're not always equal. And so this NIDA that we talked about, it matters which one occurs first. To the patient, not having new disabilities develop is probably more important than having no MRI new lesions occur in their brain that isn't causing new symptoms. But these are all lumped together, and whichever event occurs first tells you that you're not a NIDA patient anymore. 
And so finding new ways to deal with composite endpoints, because they're very, I, I think they're a better reflection of these complex diseases, is important. And there are two um, strategies or two, two kind of, of statistical methods that make a hierarchy of these different and different parts of the composite endpoint that uh, allow you to put together a more representative um, analysis of your data. And so one is called the global rank composite score. And what this does is take every patient in one arm and compare it to every patient in the other arm. For each of the endpoints that make up a comp the composite, and so in this case, they're looking at patients with scleroderma, and they've looked at mortality, organ failure, uh, how well they breathe, how well they function, and how thick their skin is. And so they've ranked them so that being alive is better than any of the, uh, that's more important than any of the other endpoints. The least important endpoint was that the skin was, was um, uh, less, less thick. And so, if with each pair comparison, they would figure out which patient did better, and they would get a one or a minus one. So if the better of the pair would get a one, the worst of the pair would get a minus one. If they were both the same, both of them need, didn't meet any of these endpoints, or both had died at the same time, then they would get a zero. And in the end, you just count up all these numbers, and there's statistical analysis, and it tells you which arm is, is, is better. And again, it looks, uh, assigns a weight, so you need to be better on mortality in, and these other endpoints rather than uh, just one endpoint or one of all of the endpoints. The second kind of, of way is, is a similar hierarchical com comparison called a winning ratio. And so then here you compare each pair of patients. You can either do this by matching the, the patient pairs, or you could do like in the composite uh, uh, score that I just talked about, compare every patient in one arm to every patient in the other arm. And those patients that um, uh, are better, they're called the winners. And at the end of the day, you just add up how many patients in each arm were winners over the total number, and the arm that gets gets um, uh, um, the better score is is uh, the winner. The the second uh, method probably has easier statistics than the first. So here I I'm just going to leave leave off with this is is some other lessons. One, it's important to build a team with the skill set for running a trial. You need uh, nurses to take care of the patients, to coordinate the patients. You need clerical staff. You need data managers. You need statisticians. You need physicians. You need to get them all on site. Otherwise, the trial will fall apart. You need to do your planning in the absence of data. And so at the beginning, like uh, uh, John had mentioned, you might want to start in small trials that lead up to a more definitive big trial. You need to engage your patients for perspective and input. They might not like that you want to drain a, a, a bag of blood out of them every every month or every year, or that they have to come every month for an MRI. And so they can provide you some useful perspective on this. And they will also help you to tell you which endpoints are important and which aren't. And finally, you need to think to the future. So once your trial is completed and you learn something one way or another, what are your next steps? And and then finally, the other part is, is if you have a product that you've developed, how do you want to commercialize it? I'm going to end there um, with a thank you to all the people that have worked with, that I've worked with on these trials and the patients who have been involved in the trials and the funding agencies that have funded these, these trials. It's been um, a, a very interesting uh, 20 years or so doing these trials, and I've learned a whole bunch of things from people that I didn't. Uh, that, that's been fascinating, and, and uh, hopefully the the knowledge that we've made through our trials will help 
people and uh, patients in the future. And so, um, uh, just before we go the rest of the time, if there are questions that uh, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs>